Uh, good evening um, and welcome. I believe this is the sixth lecture, but it might be the fifth. Um, I should know which ones they are, aren't I? Hello, anyway, and welcome to the Free University Brighton. Uh, this is a philosophy course on Plato and Deleuze. Um, we've been so far looking at the Phaedrus, and we're now beginning to move on to look at the Sophist and uh, some of the work of Deleuze. The seminar begins at 8 p.m. for people in the Free University of Brighton um, and will be held on uh, Zoom. Um, and we're looking at a text there by Deleuze called Plato the Greeks. Um, if you're in River, obviously, if you're in Fab Brother, then obviously go to River. The details are there for the seminar. If you're not in the Free University of Brighton, and you're most welcome, um, then you can always, always check in uh, if you want to ask questions or do anything like that on the Discord, a link to which is on my Twitch channel. So good evening and welcome. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit, as I sort of say in the title there, about ideas and dialectic. Um, so, <laughs> ideas. Ideas or forms, uh, these, are, these are the kind of core concept of Plato, um, supposedly. Remember we've had, I've mentioned uh, the slight difficulty in that whilst Plato is ascribed this theory of the forms or theory of ideas, in fact it's not quite so obvious, particularly if we look at certain dialogues like the Parmenides, where there's quite a lot of antagonism towards uh, the theory of forms or the theory of ideas. And similarly, if you look at the Sophist, um, at one point you find uh, the visitor from Elia talking about uh, the giants and the gods and the giants are the people who kind of believe in the body and just the body and the gods are people who believe in the forms and they talk about uh, people who um, people who, who agree with the theory of the forms in, in a sort of as though it's not them so there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of ambiguity that we can find in various places in Plato uh, as to whether he has this theory or whether he's discussing this theory um, but it definitely seems like you know even if he's discussing his theory, he's doing so in a way that's relatively sympathetic. So, generally speaking, as I say, the theory of the forms, the theory of ideas, this is seen to be something central to Platonism, and I think we can kind of work fairly comfortably with that, bearing in mind the difficulties. But what are, and I'm going to talk about ideas, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to drop this concept of forms a little bit, because sometimes people, uh, people take it to mean uh, shape, um, which it kind of does, um, but it's 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 not quite it's not quite just shape. It's more than that. Um, uh, it it has like connotations of pattern and you know the thing that unifies and a whole series of other things that we might uh, more commonly think of as something like a concept. But generally speaking, in everyday language, what's referred to here is is something that we would probably more commonly think of as uh, an idea, and this is. Um, this this word idea uh, it, it is there in Plato there's two different words that are used actually idos and idea um, uh, and so again we have to be a little careful with translation obviously we think of idea in a particular way we have to try and sort of think about the way in which Plato thinks about ideas and uh, one of the questions uh, I, I want to avoid <laughs> I want to avoid the questions what is an idea I kind of want to avoid that question. I want to avoid questions that go, what is X? What is justice? What is good? Um, and this is from Deleuze. He tries to teach us, he tries to suggest to us that that particular question, the what is question, isn't a particularly brilliant one and can get us all into all sorts of problems. So when we think about ideas, um, what I want to do is, is think about something like, what does an idea do? Now, obviously, it's something that comes up in the course of conversation, the course of dialogue. It's a kind of, um, it's a concept or, you know, an idea or a notion. It's, it's a word that's used in the course of dialogue in a specific kind of way. And the way in which it's used <coughs> is that it enables a response. It enables a response to a question. And it enables a response precisely to that question that I've just referred to. What is that? Um, what is justice? What is good? And one of the ways in which we can respond to that question is with the uh, concept of an idea. Um, so when we ask the question, what is that? 
we have to think about an answer in, in terms of certain problems that arise. Um, so let's think about, you know, what is a table? Uh, that's the question. Someone responds by pointing to a table in their room. Um, and the problem is, is, is uh, you know, is that the only table? No. There's a whole bunch of tables. There's a whole bunch of these different objects that all have the same name. And so somehow we have to go from being able to point to the thing that we can see to somehow being able to collect together a lot of these examples um, and collect them together in a way that's coherent. And so what happens is when we ask what is something, um, the specific particular examples that we're given they aren't sufficient because each one can't provide an answer for all. So each specific example, my table in my room, um, it can't tell you what your table is like. It can't tell you why that thing in your room is a table unless it's an exact copy. And even then it's going to be problematic because there's one in my room and there's one in your room. And so we've got immediately a kind of, you know, multiplicity here. Um, and so this relationship to multiplicity presents us with the problem of unification. How do we bring together lots of things, lots of examples, um, as examples of a single thing? Um, but also, how do we? It also presents problems in terms of difference. How is how is this particular example, uh, you know, different from another? Um, it presents us with other issues, some of which we begin to see in the surface as well as which w issues that we can call issues of being and not being. And I mean, we will get onto those in in later weeks. They they are really quite strange, quite problematic, and you end up with these very, very curious philosophical, um, you end up with these very few curious philosophical conversations and when you begin to talk about the being of not being and the not being of being. But all of these kind of situations arise um, when we ask what is that uh, and, and some responses um, attempt to refute our answers. Um, so if we give an example, then we can refute these uh, on the basis of, you know, examples not being sufficient. And so it's this insufficiency of the example that prompts uh, a response in terms of something shared, something common, something unifying, um, something that differentiates. And it's the idea that begins to play the role um, of enabling that unification or differentiation. One of the things we have to bear in mind is is that there's a, a difference between and and Plato's very keen on this um, in throughout the dialogues in many different ways. There's a difference between the sensations and perceptions that we encounter, um, and the way in which they're distinguished from what we might think of as understanding. Now, this is uh, something that we see in the what's called the divided line. Something we talked about. Uh, is there sort of before before an idea? Yeah, you know, we'll get to that later. Actually, hopefully, um, but the, these kind of these kind of um, uh, sense. I mean, the divided line. That the idea is that you know you move from just being able to see certain things, sensations and perceptions, into opinions, and then you begin to engage your intellect, as it were, and begin to go beyond the stuff that's just in your everyday life. And one of the things that's at play in that is a relationship of comparison. And so obviously if we were to think about, you know, let's say what is a table and we were to have maybe six or seven examples in front of us, um, what is it in a sense that enables us to compare uh, the particular examples as examples of the same thing? Um, that relationship of comparison kind of seems to need something before the example or beyond the example or outside of the example in order for comparison to begin. So not only can we ask what does an idea do, and as I say, I think it, it, you know one of the responses is that it plays a particular role um, in uh, in philosophical conversations um, that often begin with the question what is that thing, um, conversations that that go from answers and refutations to try and sort of deal with the problem. So one of the things that the idea you know, it does is it plays a role inside those conversations. Um, but where is the idea? We might also ask that question. Where is this idea? Where is the idea generally? And here we can distinguish, I think, uh, again, from within Plato's work, um, but this is obviously a, a wider distinction as well, uh, two different kinds of sense. Um, on the one hand, what we call uh, our bodily senses, the five senses, if you like, um, that stuff that we encounter through sensation and through perception and which we might, and I'll use this word later, but we might want to uh, sort of ascribe as the empirical. 
the empirical world, the world of stuff that we see around us, that we encounter around us with our bodies, with our eyes, with our ears, that we touch. Um, those kind of things uh, are perceived, and there's a kind of sense of those. A, let's call that the bodily sense. And on the other hand, there are things that we can't perceive in the same kind of way. Um, and that we would uh, sort of say something like we can understand them when we say we see what you mean we might be referring to you know something that's not bodily sense you know not something we can encounter through bodily sensation this kind of sense is the mind or the intelligible world so there are certain things that are as it were encountered um, through the mind alone and this obviously one of the prime examples of these are some of the relationships we might encounter in geometry some of the relationships we might encounter in mathematics, but also the relationships we might encounter when we talk about things like justice or the good or beauty. Um, there are certain things we might encounter when we think of reason as well. Now, the bodily sensations, um, these, these neural and nervous sensations that we have, I mean, on the one hand, they're very, very important, um, but they can also be... Uh, and this is a reduction, but they can also be reduced in some sense to something like stimulus and responses. So bodies encounter things and respond to them. Um, but the question is, is, is when that body is encountering certain things, so let's say it's encountering that table, it's encountering it through the various different senses. Um, one of the questions you might ask is, how does the coordination of those sensations arise? You know, there are certain things that are kind of in common, perhaps, uh, encountered, you know, the, the table looks a particular way, feels a particular way, but the look and the feel, these are distinct sensations. So what is it that's coordinating these sensations as sensations of the same object? What is it they have in common, as it were? What about the unity? How are they, how are they sort of, how are they connected? Um, and we can we can sort of push that a little bit further when we're thinking about other kind of patterns, patterns perhaps of behaviour, um, patterns perhaps uh, that we encounter in the world, and just patterning generally. Um, what is it that kind of brings certain things together into patterns um, and enables those patterns to be kind of encountered? And plainly, we encounter those. Um, in a sense, sensations. In a sense, in a sense, bodily. Particularly when the patterns are something like music or mathematics. You know, we can encounter those patterns, but we also encounter those patterns um, in a kind of intelligible way. Um, in other words, we can begin to uh, extract from the pattern uh, the rule that the pattern that underlies the pattern, the rule that's producing the pattern, the intelligibility of the pattern. So where in all these kind of different senses, in the bodily sense, in the mind senses, where is the idea? Well, quite often we're just going to ascribe the idea um, to the mind. And I think I want to just be a little bit careful there and say let's, let's be cautious with that. This is not necessarily what Plato means, although he might, um, but I don't think it is. And it's definitely not what Deleuze means. So where is the idea? Well, we've got three different options. Let's let's just go through those options relatively quickly. First of all, the one that most commonly occurs, the idea is in the mind. Um, and so that idea, that concept of the idea um, would be as something that's subjective. In other words, it kind of belongs to you as a subject uh, and it's different from with other people. Um, it's subjective. It's construction. Uh, it, the idea of kind of plays a role in in ordering the world you know in a, in a way so that we can sort of see those unities those connections those coordinations um, but one of the difficulties of that is it suffers from what we might call the problem of illusion um, th there's n there's no immediate way of checking or differentiating between an idea that's just somehow completely produced in the mind and is a figment of your imagination and an idea that has some sort of reality an idea that has some sort of connection to the world around it so our second option might be to say something like the, the ideas are in the world, uh, they're objective, that we discover them, that they're, they're not constructions that we kind of made up in our head. Um, here, however, there's an immediate problem of uh, access, as it were. So if the world is given to us through the bodily sensations, um, then where in no bodily sensations do we encounter the, the idea itself? Um, and if it's given to us through the mind sense, through the intelligibility, um, then it looks like it's kind of uh, collapsing back into the first option. And so the difficulty with putting the putting the idea sort of simply into the world, as though the world had 
you know ideas of justice floating about in it is that the access doesn't seem to be very viable other than through only one form of these senses other than through our intelligibility and so we seem to collapse back the idea of a world of ideas into another subject of ideas so the options are kind of difficult um in in the it's still not really clear uh, where the idea is. Uh, the most compelling account seems to be, oh, it's something in our heads, not something in the world. One option, though, the third option, and the one I want to try and work with, and I think will give us uh, a way of beginning to understand what Plato is trying to do with the concept of participation, um, is that the idea is it's in the mind in the world. Okay, so it's in the mind in the world. In other words, it's not simply uh, separated out. It's it's not as though there are two different domains of mind and world. There are minds that are active within particular worlds. Um, if you like, this is trying to contextualize the relationship of the idea. It's trying to um, make it concrete, take it away from being an abstract intellectual entity and place it back into its pragmatic and its practical relationships and its effects within the world. And I think this um, is, is very much the way in which Deleuze wants to kind of begin to think about ideas, but it is also something that he's pulling out of Plato. Um, and it, uh, th as I say, this is not necessarily Plato's idea, um, Plato's concept of the idea, but it definitely is an int a more interesting way of reading Plato, I think. So let's begin to think then of this concept of the idea in the mind, in the world, um, as a relational concept so the, the idea is a relational concept it's a concept of that relates things um, it's a, a relational coordination between something and something else right so let's l think about what on earth that's going to be so if the if the idea is as a were as it were a mode of mind in the world and another mode might be um, awe or feeling or abs you know kind of emotional relationships to the world but if the idea is a mode of mind in the world and uh, it's a way of uh, it's a relational coordination between certain things in the world um, one of the first things we have to kind of deal with is is this linguistic prejudice that we almost always bring with us um, which we might pose in terms of the question uh, do we need language to have ideas Now that might seem obvious, it might seem, well, yeah, how else are we having ideas other than through language? Now, this, I mean, th there, there's a, a difficulty here that we have to kind of uh, be aware of in the background. So what we're trying to do, and this is the difficulty, what we're trying to do is not turn ideas or not let ideas become reduced to just simply figments of our imagination because if they're figments of our imagination then they're not really relational coordination so they're not they're not doing anything they're actually just a kind of dream state as it were um, they're ways in which we kind of dream the world up and so we're trying to avoid uh, letting ideas become um, illusory we're trying to avoid letting ideas become um, ineffective or things that uh, have no um, have no impact um, and we want to kind of try and see if we can think an idea or the concept of the idea as something that has an effect um, and plainly I, I think I think the reasons for wanting to think of ideas as having effects is 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 that it seems very compelling um, to encounter ideas as having effects given the relationship that we have with them um, and this can be ideas of democracy this can be ideas of beauty this can be ideas of the table ideas seem to play fundamental roles in our lives and roles that aren't uh, um, they aren't imaginary they aren't they aren't just made up in our heads they, they play roles in which they often impose themselves upon us um, and in which we impose th our, the, the idea on other people. So struggles around equality, for example, um, are kind of struggles around the imposition and the way in which the idea of equality can coordinate and relate different things. So 
if we were to allow ideas to be nothing other than kind of language structures, simply um, things that exist just as it were in in our language, they're just words. They're not they're not real things um, in any in any in any sense other than you know um, uh, the way other words are real things. We have this difficulty of of enabling those words, enabling that sort of that 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 concept of the idea to have the effects that we're looking for, and this is this is the difficulty. We want to, when we think about what an idea is, always try and um, in this situation uh, think of the idea without r removing its capacity to affect things. So when we say something like an idea is a relational coordination, let's take, say, the idea of the university. And so what happens within a university, the idea of the university is a whole series of different processes, people, uh, practices. Um, all of them are kind of put together, brought together and, uh, and coordinated as uh, as part of that idea of the university. So the different classes, the different administrative staff, the different practical campus, you know, the role in its town, all of these things um, have, as it were, uh, a, a living ro role within the idea of the university. Um, and they also have a living role in relationship to something that's not present, uh, which is something like a goal or something like... Um, I don't want to use the word perfect, but something like the perfect or the right or the best university. Um, and so the process w processes that make up that university will be encountered and thought about and judged insofar as they advance or retreat that kind of coordination of the university through the idea of the university and through the idea of a good university. So this is the other thing that becomes crucial once we begin to think of the idea as a relational coordination. Um, it coordinates various different things, various different particulars, um, in such a way as to enable us to judge whether they are uh, good or bad forms of the idea. So let's go back to the tables. We've got 20, 30 tables. Um, we, we coordinate them all under the idea of the table, but in that idea of the table, there's also this capacity for us to judge whether table you know, number one is a better table than table number 20. And so what the idea does is it coordinates and brings particulars together into a general kind of class or set of things, um, but in such a way that not only have we got the members of the set, we've also got uh, this... Uh, criteria of judgment about whether it's a, a good or a bad form of the idea, a good or a bad table, or a good or a bad university. So we've not just got the particulars; we've also got that are coordinated up. We've also got this, as a sense, this this capacity or criteria to judge them as good or bad. Now, those particulars that are brought together with the idea, these are the things that we call we talk about as empirical, um, and empirical examples. So an empirical example of a university, there's in, in my town there's Sussex University and there's Brighton University and there's the Free University of Brighton. Um, Sussex and Brighton University are formal universities, the Free University of Brighton is an informal one. Um, what enables all of them to, you know, as it were, think of themselves as a university is in some sense this idea of the university, but each of them is going to have a different take on that. And in fact, the Free University of Brighton, one of its purposes is to begin uh, to enable a kind of rethinking or a reworking of the idea of the university. But we still relate to, and um, we're still kind of, we're not something separate in a sense. We've not gone off and, and thought about it as, as, you know, a completely separate kind of practice or process. We're still kind of organising ourselves in relationship to this idea of the university, and we're a practically empirical example. And so empirical examples, these are the things we encounter through our bodily sensations, through, you know, our perceptions, and these are the everyday stuff of the world, empirical examples. And so if... And, and, the, and in the relational coordination that the idea produces, what we find is primarily <coughs> that there's a relational coordination between the empirical and that which is not empirical. Okay, That which was, as I said earlier, like the criteria of whether it's a good table or a bad table, a good university or a bad university. Um, and so it's not just unifying and bringing together <coughs> particulars, <coughs> it's also unifying and bringing together particulars with something that's not empirical.
that criteria. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat again. I really need to have more drinks. So let's try a little sort of argument here. It's up on the screen there. I'll bring that. In fact, you should be able to see it fairly well. So if the idea is a form of relational coordination between the empirical and, let's say, something not empirical, and uh, the empirical, um, the stuff we encounter in our sensations and perceptions, if the, and the empirical is something like the instantaneous, the momentary, the transitory, it's that which we encounter in the moment, <coughs> then the idea is often encountered inside Plato as the non-empirical, that which persists, that which lasts, that which is permanent, that which in, in Plato is in the eternal. And so one of the things that's going on inside Plato is a kind of coordination. The idea is a coordination between those momentary, transitory, empirical sensations and experiences and the non-empirical, you know, permanent, persisting uh, you know, um, concept, as it were, uh, that's that's coordinating those things and enabling this criteria of good and bad to be set up. Now, that uh, brings in a kind of, I mean, nihilistic mentioned it in the chat just now, is there a before or a before an idea? Um, I mean, in a sense, the, the, the idea itself is a kind of relationship between different ways in which we encounter things those sensation and sensation the sensory encounter empirical encounter this is an encounter in time it's an encounter that has a kind of persistent uh, uh, it has a kind of duration it has a you know uh, a temporality um, whereas the idea itself in plato particularly is uh, outside of time so in a sense the idea you know it is 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 atemporal this is one of the things that wants to be that, that plato is putting forward the form or the idea uh, is not subject to the same um, changes that something within the temporal structure is. So uh, we encounter the table a, a year later. We know that the table is going to be older. Ten years later, it might be decaying, etc., etc. Th there's a whole relationship of, let's say, that transitory uh, and momentary um, encounter of sensations that we call the empirical. Now, what does the idea enable us to do? Again, another kind of question that we might want to ask about the idea. That's not what is an idea. We're asking different kind of questions. You know, where do we find it? How? Do, what does it do? What does it enable us to do? Um, you know, um, these kind of these kind of other questions are trying to look. Uh, I suppose they're trying to look at at the wider system in which an idea is operating. So what does the idea enable us to do for someone like Plato? Um, it enables us to cut the world at its joints. Uh, you remember in the Phaedrus, he has this lovely kind of example of the good butcher, the good butcher that cuts the world at the joints, at the points, we might say, of articulation. And here I mean up by articulation, I don't mean linguistic articulation. I'm, I'm thinking of the articulated lorry, you know, the front and the back of the lorry, the things that are brought together and joined together. And so uh, the good butcher enables us to cut the world at the joints at those point of articulation. Um, and I'm just going, going through some of the stuff that we've been sort of covering before. Uh, the way in which this is done is through the dialectic. Uh, which is this art of division and collection. And I said that I think we should add in, or what Deleuze would add in, is division, uh, collection, and selection. But let's, for Plato, it's primarily division and collection. Um, and that division and collection is a kind of cutting up of the world at its joints and also a putting together of the world, um, bringing things together, seeing patterns. Now, what is the role of the idea inside the dialogues? Um, it's to enable this ability to cut the world at its joints um it's in, it is to enable good butchery uh but it it doesn't presuppose as it were that it's the only kind um it kind of it always arrives i mean this is one of the interesting things about the dialogues it always arrives as it were um in the face of an already organized thought 
Um, it's not like there was no thought before, or no way in which the world has been cut, uh, cut up at its joints before. And so the idea's role is often, it seems, to reorganise what's already been organised. For example, one of the things that's really common is um, that uh, the name used for something is challenged within the dialogues. Um, linguistic habits that we have of speaking about the world are tested um, and where necessary they're corrected through the dialectic uh, so what's important here is that is that the idea is not just enabling the world to be cut at its joints it's not just enabling good butchery it's enabling and, and reorganizing our understanding so it's taking, as it were, a set of bad butchers and turning them into good butchers. It's enabling a kind of habitual understanding that, that seems coherent, but when challenged isn't, and turning it into a coherent understanding that can sustain challenges. And so it's the idea is, is not just a, a kind of abstract... Um, uh, thing out there in the ether somewhere the idea is a practical tool inside the dialogues to reorganize what's already been organized now wh what's kind of crucial here and this is where i'm going to end this first section and then we'll take a little break what's crucial here is when we're doing that reorganization one of the things we and, and, and again think about the way in which the dialogues work when we're beginning to do that reorganization what we have to ask is is, is like how does this begin what what motivates this? What what prompts the reorganisation of our linguistic habits? What might we say forces that reorganisation? Why on earth would anyone engage in some of the curious and strange conversations that we find in the dialogues? Why would they sit down and spend time doing this? What would matter enough um, for these challenges from Socrates uh, to be taken seriously? What prompts the reorganisation of our linguistic habits? What forces the reorganisation? Well, there are certain things that we can kind of identify. Uh, there are mistakes, obviously. Um, errors about the fact of the world uh, that we might encounter in phrases like, oh, I got that wrong. Um, I, I imagine a large number of people after the recent American election, uh, particularly pollsters, you know, went through this sort of process going, oh, I got that wrong. I wonder how I got that wrong. And, you know, they're trying to you know, create uh, a way to, to sort of fix their mistakes. So they're being prompted by the world, um, encountering an error. And so they're going back to the process they're engaged in, the way in which they organise the world, and they're going to reorganise it. They're going to try and do something different. The other thing, obviously, um, are what technically we m I might call aporias or... Um, Sometimes we might call them paradoxes or, or you know, uh, you know, contradictions. Even they're, they're all slightly different. Um, but here, uh, what prompts a reorganisation are things that we might call impossibilities, um, particularly when they come out from facts of reason, um, and they kind of prompt the response. Uh, something like that that cannot be right so we hear an argument it's really powerful it's really strong um, it seems irrefutable the logic we can't challenge we don't understand how it could possibly be wrong it seems almost you know uh, it's it seems almost necessary in it in its in its logical rigor um, and yet our response is something like that that cannot be right um, Quite often we encounter that now when we, when we look at philosophical arguments um, about God uh, and about theology, where 300, 400 years ago people might not have um, resisted, but now we do. Um, we say we find the same thing in our discussions, I think, of Plato when we encounter the concept of soul, which people more commonly now don't use, um, but which is obviously fundamental inside a lot of the dialogues. Um, and so that kind of second prompt or, f or thing that might force our reorganisation is reason itself when it produces certain kind of um, conclusions that it's calling on us to accept and that we go well that cannot be right um, more strictly speaking there are certain and this is what I mean by an aporia there are certain situations such as the Epimenides paradox sometimes called the Cretan liar paradox where certain statements are made um, the which have uh, implications um, that are uh, contrary to, you know, the, the, so the, the Cretan liar paradox um, is that the Cretan, the person from Crete, um, says something like, all Cretans are liars. 
and the difficulty is obviously is that this statement folds back on itself um, and so if he is a Cretan then the statement is untrue and, and you know I mean you end up with this kind of curious situation in which he can only be untrue if the statement is true uh, and so you end up with this kind of aporia where logic is producing two different responses from two different implications from the same starting point and again this kind of impossibility produced by reason produces in us this kind of sense of that cannot be right so we've got mistakes we've got like reason you know problems that arise from reason we've also got things like trauma um, feelings facts of the bodies uh, things that we often encounter with something like the phrase of I can't understand what's wrong I can't understand why I feel like this I can't understand you know what's going on um, in all of these situations mistakes uh, aporias and traumas I, these are the terms I'm using now in all of these situations what's pushing us to reorganize uh, um, way of thinking about the world are um, things impinging on us it's not a voluntary process in a sense it's not something that we've started it's not something that's arisen from the fact that we sat down with Socrates and then engaged in some abstract questioning there's something that's pushed us into the situation in which we want to find out more there's some problem that we need to try and deal with um, and that word problem is going to be something that we're going to encounter more and more over the coming weeks um, and again this is something that's coming in from Deleuze where he begins to talk about ideas as forms of problem and so if we're being prompted to reorganize we're being prompted by these kind of impinging forces of the world we're being, being prompted as it were by the problems um, what's pushing us when we try and reorganize is an attempt to learn that's what we're trying to do um, I want to I must I want to get that right I want to understand how I'm feeling I must be able to you know get that right I must be able to understand how I'm feeling uh, what's important here um, is that what we can see is that knowledge is not idle okay knowledge is not abstract and neutral um, knowledge is not something that in a sense is a kind of game although often this is how we encounter it inside philosophy as a kind of game um, what we encounter in fact in our everyday life when we're being prompted to reorganize is, is that knowledge is uh, engaged it's active it's directional it's pushing us um, and problems push us uh, to as it were turn back on ourselves and think about you know our capacities to understand um, and this active practical engaged relationship of knowledge um, is kind of central if we're going to begin to think about um, what an idea is it's something that is part of the role of learning it begins to play its role as I said earlier it begins to play its role in certain situations it's not just out there in the world outside of all context it's 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 it's, it's arising in specific kind of problem situations and it's arising as a way of reorganizing those problems anyway I'm going to take a uh, uh, just a couple of minutes break here and I'll be back uh, at, uh, in, in two minutes that's, that's at 1940 um, on mine but in two minutes depending on what you're what, what you're watching um, and we'll uh, finish off a little bit then okay so just a couple of minutes take a break and have a walk around get yourself a drink um, and I'll see you in a minute or two
Okay, let's um, let's continue. I'm going to skip uh, a couple of bits of my notes, so let's just skip that one, um, and let's go to this. So I want to continue this idea of of the idea, <laughs> continue this discussion rather, of the idea as something that enables us to reorganise what's already been organised. So let's take the human uh, as something that has two different relationships um, to the social. In the first relationship we are what we might call incultured. Um, this is the process of socialization. So this is, as it, this is in some sense what we might think of as the primary organization, the first stage of organization. So if the idea is something that's going to reorganize what's already been organized, it's through enculturation, through socialization, that we are at first organized. Part of that process involves, of course, language. Um, part of that process involves manners and behaviors and etiquettes. And part of that process involves things that, loosely speaking, we could call ideas. Um, these we might want to put into a big box called common sense uh, there are difficulties there but let's just say for now that, that we are first of all organized into a particular context we're incultured into a particular kind of human context and part of that context is not just language um, but a series of behaviors and also a series of ideas although at this point these ideas are uh, trained they're pushed as it were, into you. Um, and so to a certain extent, you are formed, you are produced, you are organised um, through this enculture, through this socialisation process. Now then let's just think about the way in which the dialogues take place. So the dialogues begin with people that are already encultured. They're already speaking to each other. They've already got certain behaviours and certain norms um, certain etiquettes, we see this all over the place in which they might refer to, you know, appeasing the gods, giving prayers, being polite to each other. You know, there's certain ways in which they behave. So the dialogues begin with people who are already organised, already encultured, already socialised. And then a series of questions and answers, refutations and conversations, divisions and collections take place, um, all of which kind of are coordinated through particular ideas so in the idea in the phaedrus for example the idea of love coordinates a large chunk of the first half and then the idea of something like persuasion rhetoric or true speaking um, much of the second half and in this second process what we might say is that we're accultured um, now an acculturation process is something that we encounter uh, in uh, immigration situations where people are moving from one culture to another okay and so uh, the person who's moving into a new culture um, has to become accultured they've already become encultured they've already been socialized in the, in you know where they come from uh, but now they have to kind of reorganize themselves um, they don't have to obviously i mean <laughs> what i'm saying is they do this is generally the process of what's going on and think of that as learning a second language perhaps so you learn a second language you learn a second sort of set of norms you learn a set and second practices um, and you have so enculturation this first primary organization and then acculturation this kind of second moment in which you're moving from one space to another and you're acculturating as an immigrant in this space and this in a sense is what's taking place inside the dialogues um, we are taking ourselves from the position of just being socialized humans um, in a kind of habitual unthinking way. In other words, we, we haven't kind of coordinated how we're going to be organized. We've just become organized. We haven't kind of thought before about how we want to do that. We've just been organized by our society. And we're being pushed by the philosophers um, to enter a new kind of realm. This is the realm of the intelligible for Plato, um, in which the realm of the rational, if you like. Um, but what's important to remember is that as we begin to be pushed into that realm, the ideas sort of, as it were, catching us and bringing us into that realm, we are in that realm as immigrants. We are in that realm uh, as people who are unfamiliar 
um, with its rules, its norms and its language. And so one of the things that we are doing in the dialogues, one of the things that's taking place in the dialogues is this acculturation process, um, acculturation to the rational and acculturation to thinking. And so the dialectic, and specifically the dialectic, is employed as an acculturational to rational norms, um, uh, an acculturation to doing things in such a way that we allow reason to tell us more than sensation what's right and what's wrong and, and what we kind of, uh, as it were, ought to believe. Now, crucially, what we encounter at, at the here are, are moments in which the conclusions within the world of reason um, will run counter to the empirical. They will challenge what it is we see in the world um, and the way in which we perceive the world. Um, and we, we find this in our modern world uh, sometimes uh, kind, of, um, uh, kind of taken over by science, which will often tell us that some of its conclusions will be, um, you know, will run counter to the way in which we see things, counter to the way in which we will perceive things. Um, and it won't necessarily change the perceptions the perceptions will still, as it were, exist, um, but our understanding will will be altered by this new scientific example, our new scientific experiment, um, and it will change the way in which we have to think about the world or in which we're told to think about the world. Um, and so this is what the world of, of reason, this is what the world of forms or ideas uh, is going to be doing when it reorganises uh, the way in which we've already been organised. It's going to... Um, try and change the way in which we coordinate things and we think of things sort of being put together in the world. It's going to change the way in which we think the world is put together. Um, it's going to argue that it's cutting the world at its joints. It's doing good butchery rather than bad butchery. Um, but it's going to do this often at moments at which uh, the rational conclusion is going to be in conflict with what it is we see in the world and sensations or perceptions of the world. It's at those moments um, where you can't have both, where one has to be chosen, and that we're really being pushed by, um, by, by, by the world of reason to to move away from seeing, believing what we see, um, and the way in which they do this, the way in which the world of reason operates, is through what we can call implication structures. Um, and so uh, arguments that begin with certain conclusions, certain premises and certain starting points lead to certain conclusions. Um, but the way in which they lead to are through these implication structures. Um, and these implication structures are, are, they, they are rules of binding together the conclusion with the starting point. Um, we often encounter them in terms of if-then phrases. So if X, then Y. Um, now that if then, this is an implication structure. If we agree to X, then we kind of forced into a position of agreeing to Y. And what these implication structures do is they produce uh, a kind of borderline, a, a point at which we can kind of see the border of the rational. It expels sensation as being a uh, primary access to the world and says well no you, you if you want to enter the world of the rational you kind of have to have to cross this border have to agree to the rules of implication one of the things that's implicit is that is that and this is in the divided line of plato you actually see this kind of hierarchy moving up and this implicit hierarchy of the rational um the rational takes itself to obviously as it were be a better world um, than the irrational but it also takes itself to obviously be a better world than the transitory world of sensations and perceptions um, and it takes itself to be the world in which real judgment accurate judgment and true judgment takes place and so it operates um, a kind of border control uh, in other words, it kind of says to you um, that in this, if if you want to enter the world of the rational, there are certain things you're going to have to give up, certain opinions, certain conclusions, certain thoughts about the way in which the world is, certain ways in which you've organised the world um, and the way in which your world is organised that you will have to kind of give up 
um, in order to be able to come into um, the world of rational judgment. Now, why, why, why is the why, why is it as it were why is it like reason cannot get along with um, uh, just being a kind of interesting tool, an interesting technique? Why does it feel this or or present itself as this kind of overarching uh, form of organizing the world? Again, this in some sense comes back to the idea of things that are forcing us to begin to think in the first place. What kind of um, situation is pushing us, um, what kind of problem is pushing us to think in such a way that we uh, almost expel our own sensation, our own perception, our own engagement in the world. We almost expel that and replace it with a kind of rationally reorganized perception and engagement with the world. There's an interesting moment in letter 8, um, this is in 354 and letter 8 that Plato writes. This is about his political engagement um, with Syracuse. And he's talking at one point there about uh, Lycur Lycurgus, Lycur Lycurgus? Lycurgus um, who is the founder of Sparta. And he says that Lycurgus witnessed his own family in Argos and Messen become kings, become absolute rulers. And this is to quote Plato. Fearing for his own state of Sparta, as well as his family, he found a remedy by giving authority to the elders and by making the ephors, which is a council of five like overseers, by giving the ephors a salutary check upon the power of the kings. So what's going on, what Plato's talking about is this situation in which Lycurgus is uh, trying to avoid um, tyranny. He's trying to avoid the kind of madness, the irrationality, of tyranny um, and the destruction that tyranny brings, including the self-destruction um, that it brings. But what's important to note here is the way in which this is described. Fearing for his own state. It's not It's not described in terms of him sitting down and thinking, well, what's the best way of doing this? And what's What's the way in which we should reorganise a state? This is not the discussion that we're presented with in the Republic, for example, in which we seem to have this kind of almost game-like, uh, abstract discussion going on. Um, no, what we're being shown here is something that's arising from a problem that's forcing Lycurgus to come up with a different kind of solution. Um, the fear of this self-destruction that might arise from tyranny. And what Plato says arises from this, and this is again to quote him in the same point, in this way the state has been gloriously preserved for all the generations since his time. Important point next. Since law became the sovereign king over men instead of men becoming arbitrary masters of the law. And this speaks to why the world of reason often wants to impose itself in a kind of totalitarianism. It kind of wants to impose itself as the most uh, thorough reorganisation of the way in which we are organised. It wants to impose itself um, <coughs> because it wants to produce, or in a sense enable us to produce um, a compulsion beyond the individual, a compulsion beyond the arbitrary, a compulsion um, that we are, as it were, able to um, self-compel ourselves to accept. Um, and this is in the form of the law. And so reason presents itself as a way in which, uh, it, as a kind of something outside of the human almost something that's going to solve the problems or enable us to solve the problems of many humans living together um, many voices in a cacophony a kind of you know uh, difficulty of opinion now it's unsurprising perhaps that this arises in relationship to things like cities it's unsurprising that it arises in situations in which this problem isn't again an abstraction that's uh, something from a book or something from you know idle thought it arises at a point at which the actual practice of living with other human beings 
um, and more importantly the actual practice of living with other human beings who get to make decisions about our lives um, whether they be governors or kings or uh, e-fools living in that situation where other humans get to make decisions about our lives presents us with a situation in which um, we have a kind of methodology um, a way in which everyone is meant to behave that we can agree upon this is what reason begins to offer a kind of abstract set of uh, rule formation methods um, not necessarily rules themselves but ways of forming rules um, an abstract set of rule formation methods that enable us to take ourselves out of the arbitrary nature of the human and what we mean by that concretely is outside of the arbitrary nature of human power um, and so ideas and reason and this notion of the intelligible and the way in which the forms themselves operate uh, are, I think, for Plato, not just uh, a kind of uh, interesting philosophical game about how we bring various different empirical examples together, empirical examples of perception into a unified whole. It's not just an abstract game about how we might... Um, as it were, uh, be able to identify what's permanent and subsisting in something like a table rather than what's transitory and momentary. It's also, crucially, um, a way of us enabling power to be taken away from uh, the arbitrary relationship to another human and placed into a situation, um, as it were, outside of or above transcending the human. Um, it becomes, crucially, the idea of reason as sovereign. And what that means is of the human as submitting to reason. And in this situation, the idea is is often, I think, best thought of um, as something like, and this is unsurprising perhaps from Plato, as something like a kind of god, as something like a kind of new sovereign, a new power, um, or a new world, a new space in which... Uh, things run well things run perfectly so that in the world of reason that we're entering into this you know if, if we're an immigrant into the world of reason inside the world of reason everything runs like clockwork everything runs as it should everything runs perfectly um, whereas in the world of humans everything runs uh, in its usual chaos everything runs is a mess everything is a kind of you know, um, you know confusing cacophony of the anarchic in you know desires and relationships we all have and so the idea is offering us a kind of glimpse of a clean world a world that's um, no longer subject to these arbitrary um, and uh, you know dangerous relationships to power and it's therefore a, a response not to an abstract philosophical idea it's a response to a concrete problem of power that's really what the idea is about and the dialectic is the form of enabling us to as it were encounter the idea and deal with it okay so i'm just gonna um <coughs> finish off for for now um Thanks for your time and for listening and for all your likes and follows. It's very, very lovely uh, to get follows and likes. Do do that. I do like it. Um, and it's also useful just in terms of other stuff in Plato. Next week, f particularly for people on in the seminar, <coughs> obviously I'll put the reading up uh, in Inside River, um, but we're going to be reading um, uh, Plato and the Simulacrum from Deleuze. It's a long-ish piece, not ridiculously long, um, but we'll be looking at that um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the seminar. But if you're reading along with us at the moment, we are reading The Sophist, continue reading The Sophist, and if you're interested in your Deleuze side of it, then read Plato and the Simulacrum and I'll be talking a little bit about that next week thank you for your time and um, all your loving all that sort of stuff and uh, i will see you soon see you next week possibly <laughs>